This is Chapter 2, Overview of the Educational Research Process. I'm Samuel Sennett, Assistant Professor in Special Ed at Portland State University. We're going to think about the steps in the educational research process. We're going to think about them on a certain depth level here and now at the beginning of the course. And then over the rest of the course, we're going to delve deeper in the different specific uh, steps in the process. First, we're focused, uh, looking forward to this chapter three uh, that I've mentioned a couple times in class, or in the chat, rather, that identifying and limiting a research topic or problem. This chapter three is fantastic uh, for going through that. And you're going to learn how to formally state and refine your research questions. Very important. Uh, I'm constantly doing this in my own research. It's uh, humbling at times, but incredibly uh, important. You're going to be then looking at how to review literature. You hear literature, reviewing literature. This is studying research that people have done related to your problem. Along with doing that review, you need to be able to write a literature review. Now that means synthesizing and analyzing. It's not an annotated bibliography. It's deriving meaning out of a body of literature. And with that knowledge, we're gonna bring that knowledge into developing our research plan, and then we're gonna lay out a methodology in that research plan, and we're gonna implement that research plan, collect the data. We're gonna follow that up with analyzing the data. It's a very logical next step. We have it, then we analyze it. And Following that analysis, we're going to state our findings, conclusions, recommendations, and a written research report. Over the course of the year, if you're taking this intro course and then the uh, companion project courses, you're going to go through each of these eight steps. It's going to be really fun, at times a bit challenging, but what uh, is really worthwhile that doesn't have an element of challenge. The educational research process. We talked about how this is cyclical, and you can see this uh, cyclical nature even inside uh, a particular single study or, or single uh, iteration here. We may identify the research problem, state these questions, look at the literature, review it, develop this research plan, implement the plan, analyze that data and then develop conclusions or write up a report publish it that's going to lead us to some future research questions or maybe there are limitations in the original study that we want to focus on do better at back to a new research problem or revision of that research problem ask new questions back through the cycle so you can see that uh, circle and it starts with a topic, something you're interested in, something you had previous experience with. It's something you really want to know the answer to. It's got to be genuine. And you're also going to ask yourself, is this, is this a topic or area that I can even approach right now? Now, it's not always essential to be realistic, but... It's important if you're doing real research to be feasible. Moving on to formally stating research questions. Carefully wording these is critical. It guides the remainder of the study. It's focusing your efforts. An important aspect is that it must be answerable based on what you are laying out as your methodology for data collection. So, Figuring this out at the end of the study is too late. Uh, you have to take care to align your research questions. Constantly be going back to, does this help me answer my research question? It's that simple. Reviewing existing literature. This is something you're really going to enjoy. What's nice is you get to uh, build background, uh, guide your study through reading about your topic area that hopefully you care a great bit about. It's uh, important uh, because you are reading this 
literature related to your topic. It can be all kinds of things, textbooks, research articles. Um, you're going to, you're going to, uh, you could experience some challenge with writing a literature review. A lot of people have this uh, uh, misconception that you're just reviewing literature, like stating, oh, this study has been done, this is what it said. It's, you have to synthesize and analyze. And there's, while there's no magical formula for doing this, there are uh, some general principles for thinking about how to synthesize, uh, compare and contrast. Uh, you can code for, for certain important elements based on what you do know about the, the research base. There's a number of tips that we're going to delve into in the literature review section of the course. When you develop a research plan, this is the specification of exactly how you will do that work. What data will you get? What style will this be? Will it be qualitative, quantitative, mixed methods? And does this data already exist? Are you probing a source like a database? Or are you requiring that you collect original data, like the intervention research we do? We go out and work with children who have difficulty speaking. And we study their performance, with, uh, typically with communication partners. So when you're developing a research plan, you want to ask yourself some important questions. Um, it, it's, you know, will you have to make up your own instruments, your own uh, data observational tools, such as a survey or rating scale? I had to do this for uh, evaluating my interventions, acceptability. So it's important to know this because you're, going to have to read up and justify your decisions with that. Uh, you're going to ask, how will the data be collected? When will it happen? And then how will we ensure that this is good data, this concept of inter-rater reliability, uh, having multiple people look at the data? And if the data needs to be collected from human participants, who's actually going to do it? How's it logistically going to work? Uh, it's very important to, to be detail-oriented in this. So how many participants will you need? What techniques will you use to analyze this data? And again, always coming back to, does this fit our research question? And then pervasive in all research with people is, is this ethical? Is this the right thing? You can't mess around with people you can't um, you can't waste people's time. It has to be uh, important work that people are treated with respect, and uh, this concept of ben, you know beneficence. So, in collecting data, uh, aka implementing your research plan, uh, you may do observations, surveys, interviews. You may look at existing documentation. And you might be looking at things that are routinely happening in schools. There might be existing data sources. And when you have that data, you're going to analyze it. And it's really going to depend on what kind of data you have, what kind of research you're doing. And uh, quantitative data typically occurs after all the data has been collected. Th this is um, uh, only partially true with single case design. You're collect your data and be scoring it as you go. So um, this is, uh, you know, it's some of these things are blanket statements. This is um, uh, roughly true. <laughs> um, and oftentimes you're going to use some sort of statistical or analytical software programs to help you uh, analyze the quantitative data. And so with qualitative data, the, the reason why that last statement about quantitative is tricky is, is yeah, it's generally true. You collect your data and you're going to have that and analyze it. With qualitative data, you may be analyzing 
while you're taking data. When we did this focus group, I was the note taker on one of the sessions. I was analyzing the data right as we were collecting it, and it was influencing our actual data collection because we'd ask follow-up questions based on what we were recording. So uh, and there are ways to make qualitative data collection and analysis much more or much, much less subjective in this concept of polyangulation, uh, this idea of coming at things from different angles and um, you can have uh, triangulation where you have multiple sources. So with mixed methods, people talk about it as this best of both worlds approach and you can uh, come at it from uh, this uh, polyangulation approach uh, to uh, get at different aspects of your research question, basically. Multiple aspects of that, polyangles. So, hopefully we get to this final research report and you'll get your master's degree. And at the end of the research reports, you see this word, the discussion, or the findings, results, that come towards the end, and then your conclusions and recommendations. The results and discussion are where the research uh, questions are answered. And there's much more than that, though, however. It's, uh, you, you, wanna, you wanna put those answers into context you want to talk about the implications for practice. You're going to be reflecting on the context and the exact setting aspects of the study that are important that, that may relate to uh, the, the implications of the data for that research question. And so when we ask these questions, we want we want to we want to see what what really is meant by what, what does this mean for the field of education what are the implications for practice what 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 might be expect if we have a kid like this or uh, parents looking at this uh, or teachers looking at this what recommendations can we derive and can we drive any bits of theory from this as well as specific strategies and so this can't just be uh, you're making things up. This is you ask real research questions. You do rigorous research methods mm -hmm. that help you collect data and then analyze that data so that uh, your conclusions and recommendations flow logically through this process. That you've asked the questions, you've collected and analyzed the data, and then you're going to derive those conclusions and recommendations from that data and the analysis of that data. And so one of the problems or you know, cardinal sins in research is that you, you don't want to uh, be so uh, bold as to, to state these global and uh, far-reaching statements that go beyond the specific research study or the parameters that are there. and this is uh, something uh, I've worked on with my research is that it's okay to state the limitations. It's okay mm -hmm. to be at the edge. It's what actually drives your next studies and validates that those are important. So it's okay to, for instance, in, in some aspects of the work I do with people with complex communication needs, there's not that much that's been done. You gotta be where you're at. And so whichever topic you choose, you're going to work where you're at, and you're going to read studies. You're going to see how studies relate to each other, uh, especially when you get to see a practice that's evolved over time. You can see how different researchers were studying over time and how they asked one question and then another. Things built off each other. And uh, you'll be jumping in with your topic somewhere along that line. Exciting. Exciting. Exciting process. I'm excited to share it with you. Mm.